Hi, my name is Francisco Arriaga. I'm a Extension Soul Scientist with University of Wisconsin Madison. And today I want to uh, share with you a few thoughts on residue management and soil compaction. So when I uh, talk about residue management, most of the time I'm actually referring to tillage. And we know there's uh, two different types of tillage that we can uh, group uh, large sections, if you will. Uh, so primary tillage, uh, and that's mainly to control the amount of residue at the surface, uh, typically done in the fall. And then the secondary tillage, which is to prepare the seedbed and uh, usually also bury some residue. Anytime you do any type of soil manipulation, you will be burying residue and in, 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 uh, um, affecting that soil in one way or another. Um, there can be a lot of issues when we do the tillage. It's not just the type of tillage, but also the timing of the operation, the speed of the operation, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the biggest, biggest issue is when we do tillage, when the soils are wet, it can really damage uh, soil structure and reduce porosity, which will decrease uh, productivity. And also, uh, tillage, residue, uh, tillage affects the amount of residue on the soil surface uh, directly. So, uh, one uh, thing that is very important when we talk about tillage management, it's the type of tillage or tillage selection that we're going to do. And so there's a lot of factors that we must consider when we're looking at this. Uh, obviously, there will be some regulation requirements if you are having to follow a uh, nutrient management plan. Um, so there could be some conservation plan requirements too. Um, but also your soil properties. Um, what type of soil do you have, uh, the slope of your soils and what have not, will also have an impact on your selection of your tillage. Um, residue management, it's, it's, it's usually seen as secondary, but um, but it's also a very important factor depending on your conditions and your uh, crop management scenarios such as uh, corn and corn that becomes crucial in those type of scenarios. Uh, so things to watch out for would be the uh, spring, spring temperature, uh, soil moisture in the spring usually but also during the growing season and the interference with uh, planting equipment. Uh, so the idea or the uh, logic behind it is that the more residue you have on the soil surface the lower your temperatures are going to be in the spring so it takes longer for that soil to warm up because less soil is exposed and so that residue acts as a uh, insulation however uh, when we look at a uh, the amount of residue it affects also the amount of moisture in the soil so um, the reason why soils in the spring warm up a lot slower it's not only because of that they're exposed and the color and and uh, the effect of the sunlight hitting it but also because that acts as a mulch so um, if you have a lot of residue on the surface, it's not a good thing in the spring uh, in a lot of conditions, but then later on in the season when it gets hot and really warm, uh, that residue uh, again acts as a mulch and will keep a lot of that moisture in the soil and it helps uh, water infiltration and a lot of other hydraulic, soil hydraulic properties. Too little residue uh, in the soil surface also can lead to uh, issues with erosion. So there's other factors uh, that can uh, affect the consideration of what tillage to use, uh, as, uh, such as the amount of residue remaining. Uh, again, this goes back to the crops you have in your rotation. Uh, also, do you have the need to incorporate uh, either lime or different fertilizer or manures? Uh, some tillage equipment, it's uh, better equipped or better at doing those type of jobs. Um, but also having in mind that the soil disturbance increases the erosion potential and there's a huge variation between manufacturers and, and the different tools. Not only that, also a lot of options that, that are offered can really uh, change the way that a uh, type of uh, tillage equipment, just specific tillage equipment, um, can operate, can, can function in the field. Um, another way to classify uh, tillage equipment is by looking at the amount of residue they leave on the soil surface. So usually we call uh, tillage equipment, uh, reduced tillage, uh, something that leaves about 15 to 30 percent residue on the surface, uh, something that leaves less than that we call conventional, uh, and then something that leaves more than 30 percent uh, residue, it's what we call conservation tillage. Uh, if you recall, uh, residue, 30 percent residue on the soil surface or more, uh, will lead to uh, a decreasing erosion potential of up to 50 percent. So that's why we call that conservation tillage. So how do we measure residues on the, on the, uh, on the soil? Uh, we can use a method that's been used for a long time. It's called the transect method. So what you do with that is that 
uh, you lay a, a tape measure diagonally across your rows in the field. Uh, in this case, I have an example that we laid it out about 100 feet. You can do the same thing with uh, 10 feet sections and do it several uh, places in your field. And so what you're going to do is that you're going to count the amount of residue um, that hits at one foot interval. So in this case, you see one foot uh, here at three feet mark where I'm uh, pointing. There's no really residue in there, so that would be a zero. Uh, here at four, we have some stalks and a little bit of leaves. We uh, call that a one. And so we add on that 100 foot transect how many hits we have. And then we add them up. And so if you're doing 100 feet, that would be your percentage. If you're uh, using just a 10 foot section, you multiply that by 10, and that would give you the percentage. Um, when we're looking at uh, residue, um, you can count manure as a as, as residue. However, you should not count roots. Um, I'm sorry, rocks as as uh, residue. So here's an example of a primary tillage tool, uh, very common um, here in Wisconsin, uh, chisel plow. It could be um, less aggressive than other ones, uh, depending how it's set up. And this is the reason why I'm using an example, just to uh, kind of iterate this uh, importance of the setup. It can bury less residue depending on the point or the setup of it. Um, uses um, moderate uh, fuel compared to other ones. Um, it doesn't require a lot of time. And if used properly or properly set up, it can be uh, considered a conservation tool. So it's a very flexible tool, and I think this, uh, this is why it's so popular here in Wisconsin, so commonly used. So here's an example on the setup. Uh, so what we're looking at here on, under the type section on the left is uh, if it has disks or not, so no disk, a coulter, uh, and a disk. Then what type of point, uh, going from sweep to point to shovel, and then fragile soils and non-fragile soils. And the percentage here is the amount of residue left. And so I have included these red lines kind of showing off the aggressiveness of these uh, setups, going from less on the top to more aggressive at the bottom. So you can see then as you move from top to bottom that um, less aggressive setup will leave more residue on the soil surface under both soil types. Uh, and as you have a more aggressive uh, uh, setup, uh, then you leave less residue on the, uh, on the soil surface. Here's another example looking just visually at different tillage systems. Um, I don't know, you're looking at them, it would be hard to tell what they are. Maybe that one in, in the bottom here you can kind of guess. But uh, here's uh, what they are. Um, chisel, a plow with twisted shovels, a combination tool. These are becoming very popular, uh, especially in areas that may be more prone to compaction. Uh, strip till, I think that's a great... Um, uh, system where you have an area where you're preparing your seat bit, but then in between you have an, an area kind of similar to a no-till scenario. And here's a vertical tillage example where um, there was not a lot of residue on that field to begin with, but you can see that it, it does a, a pretty good job of bearing residue. In this case, I think maybe a, a little too good of a job because uh, just by looking at it, we have less than 30% left in, in this scenario. So let's switch gears a little bit and uh, address uh, some soil compaction issues. Um, so if you look at the left on this graph, on this figure here, uh, we have the soil not compacted. If you uh, remember when we we're talking about soil as a three-phase system, having the solid part and then the porosity that can be either filled with air or water. So what compaction essentially does is that it squeezes out the pore space out of the soil. So we have that soil basically uh, squeezing out or that soil occupying, the solid part occupying more, more of, that, of that volume of soil and very little uh, space left then for air or water to, to, uh, to reside or to be or to occupy. So obviously as you can see that will only not affect uh, root growth but it can also affect a water relations in the soil. So what are the symptoms of or signs of soil compaction? So we're looking at the soil uh, if we look at the soil, we uh, can see that it would have uh, greater penetration resistance. Uh, you can a lot of times see standing water on uh, compacted soils. Uh, if you uh, drive during a good uh, rainfall event and look at fields, usually where water starts puddling is uh, where you have your tire tracks, and those areas are the ones that tend to be more compacted. Um, and also, uh, compacted soils are going to have poor structure. Uh, if you think about the different types of structure, the compacted soils will have more of that massive structure. So they won't have the blocky or the granular or the uh, columnar type, type structure. 
Uh, you can also look at plants to try to figure out if you have a compaction issue or not. So you, one of the uh, effects is that you'll see stunted growth. Uh, there might be nutrient deficiencies. Uh, one of the number one issues is um, a reduction in uh, potassium uptake. So you, the soil compaction can manifest itself as a uh, potassium deficiency a lot of times. Uh, you will see um, roots that are not formed properly. They're not growing properly. So if you pull uh, several plants and you look at them, you can see those signs on, on, on the roots. And obviously a reduction in yield. Uh, and here's a, a uh, example of uh, the impact on yield of uh, compaction can have. So we can see um, different crops uh, in different counties of the, of the state, and then uh, different compaction levels going from no compaction to medium to heavy. And the numbers in red essentially um, tell you the reduction in yield relative to the no compaction. So here an example, the top one, alfalfa, uh, reduction of 13% in yield. Uh, can go as high as 43% in this case in uh, for corn. So um, a big issue for productivity. So in order to address compaction issues, we need to know what causes compaction. So what, what are the causes of compaction? So number one is the trafficking at the wrong time. And what, what I mean by that is um, getting out in the fields when they're too wet uh, with our equipment. Uh, essentially what we're doing is crushing those aggregates in the soil and squeezing again that pore space out. Another thing that's happening throughout the years is that uh, equipment has been getting bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. And so axle loads have increased tremendously in the last few decades. And that actually has been contributing to uh, incidents of compaction. This growth in, in equipment uh, relates to a lot of times with um, the shift that we be having in, in farms where we need to uh, farm larger, larger areas in order to stay profitable. So it's just kind of a reality of things. Uh, another another issue that uh, creates a lot of problem with compaction or increases compaction is um, running uh, your tires with higher pressure than, than recommended by the manufacturer. So high tire pressures are a big, big problem. Uh, the other issue with that is that the higher your tire pressure, the less efficient your tractor becomes. You get more slippage. So that's a double whammy. So that actually it's important to look at uh, tire pressure. Um, repeated traffic, it could be... Uh, very harmful for uh, for compaction, create a lot of compaction. Uh, but have in mind that under the right conditions, the first pass of a vehicle can cause up to 70% of that uh, compaction. Uh, excessive tillage uh, can be a big problem. Every time we do uh, any tillage operation, we will be breaking some of the uh, aggregation in the soil. Um, so doing some tillage uh, when needed, not a big deal. The soil can bounce from that. But if we do a lot of recreational tillage, um, that will cause problems with uh, over uh, destruction of aggregates and will uh, really affect the aggregation of that soil. Once that soil has lost its uh, aggregation, it will be a lot more susceptible to uh, compaction. Think about a recently tilled field. If you go walking in that field right after tillage, uh, what happens? You actually sink in that field. So that field essentially has lost its ability to hold the load. And so again, that goes to the uh, next point in here, which is the poor soil structure. Again, so any management that you can do to uh, improve uh, soil aggregation, soil structure, such as use of manures, cover crops, all those things that we have talked about in the past will help uh, with uh, compaction management. So i uh, talk briefly about the diagnosing uh, soil compaction. So the two most effective ways, I think, in my view, to do that, it's looking at roots. Here's an example of a uh, corn root. Uh, what uh, typically we call the pancake root system. That's the technical term, right? Um, so this is more indicative of uh, shallow uh, compaction where the roots are not able to penetrate uh, the soil deep in, in, in the profile. Uh, we're looking at a tap-rooted uh, type uh, crop such as soybean. Uh, we see what we call uh, J-rooting. So the tap root is actually trying to penetrate that a compacted layer, but then cannot penetrate. And so it goes laterally to try to find an area of least uh, resistance. And so uh, it tries to keep doing that, and we can get this uh, really odd-looking root system. Another good tool for uh, assessing soil compaction is use of the penetrometer. Here's a schematic of a soil penetrometer. Essentially, it's just a stainless steel rod with a uh, pointy uh, end. And we push that into the ground uh, to give us an idea of the relative bulk density of that soil and assess a, the uh, compaction um, status of that soil. So a couple of tips uh, on soil compaction. 
Um, so things that we can do to uh, management compaction would be to avoid traffic when soils are wet. Uh, try to reduce the axle load. So way to think about it is to try to use the lightest equipment uh, when possible. So not if you having to do a certain task, can you do that with a smaller tractor? Uh, use of uh, radial tires or tracks in a lot of, a lot of scenarios can be useful, uh, but keeping those uh, tires at the right uh, pressure, it's uh, crucial. Uh, the other thing too is to maybe plan ahead the traffic patterns uh, in the field. A lot of people are going to control traffic, uh, maybe you know, don't need to go to, to that level of uh, management, but uh, planning certain traffic uh, operations through the field could be beneficial. Um, also reducing the number of passes uh, could, could be beneficial in, in reduced uh, compaction. Uh, and a lot of times we might have subsoil compaction and that, that is needed um, to um, improve the uh, rooting um, conditions. Uh, so if that is needed, uh, just have in mind that the most effective way of running a subsoiler is to run the point of that uh, subsoiler two to three inches below the bottom layer of the subsoil compacted layer. And a way that I like to think about a soil compaction is that it's better to think ahead and try to prevent it than try to remediate or, or, or uh, eliminate it in the future. And here's an example of that. Um, this is a, a computer uh, tomography or CD scan of uh, soil samples down to one foot. And this was done in an area, a uh, research uh, scenario, where uh, these researchers, researchers um, had done soil compaction 29 years prior to taking the course. So we see on the left a no compacted area. And so what we're seeing there, all those uh, little uh, lines in there, that's actually macro porosity or porosity in the soil. And then you can see on the right, that's actually the compaction done 29 years before that. And you can see after 29 years, you can still see the effects of that compaction in there where the aggregation of that soil has been affected. So this to me highlights two things, is that compaction will not go away on its own. These two soils were actually treated the same way, managed the same way. Uh, but it also highlights that if you do have subsoil compaction, subsoiling can be quite effective at managing that issue. If you uh, need a little bit more information in detail, I um, direct you to the A3588 uh, publication, Management of Wisconsin Soils. Okay.